Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm just going to get us started. Um, I, I always want to be respectful of our alums time because they're so generous with uh, taking time out of their busy schedules to meet with us. So welcome to our first uh, session of lessons learned for our student athletes. Uh, this one is going to be focused on consulting and uh, business analytics and management consulting. But honestly, I think the lessons learned that you're going to be hearing from our alums are going to cross industry. So really feel free to join us in the other sessions as well because our alums really do have incredible insight to share with you all. Um, this was a brainchild, I think, of Matt Weldy of the Monogram Club and me, I think, when we were having a conversation just about ways that we could um, work together. My name is Linda Lynch, and I work for the Center for Career Development, along with James, who I think all of you, all the student athletes know James Biddick very well as your, um, as your counselor. But I specifically am focused on the regional efforts in California. So, um, and specifically in the Los Angeles area, but post COVID we'll be heading up to the Bay area to help to support finding internship and job opportunities for students up in um, all over California. But what James and Matt and I also do is a lot of programming. We really want the students to, to get connected, um, to get information about what's out there. So I'm gonna launch it off to Matt to introduce himself and, um, and then we'll just keep things going quickly. Awesome, thanks Linda. Um, and yes, just echoing, echoing your comments, they're excited to um, kind of get creative in this virtual world. Obviously we like to do these things in person and on campus and uh, we'll return to that eventually, but we definitely wanted to utilize the extended 10 week winter break to, to provide some kind of career discernment opportunities and um, just thankful to, to all of you for joining. Um, thankful for the partnership with, with Linda and James and the Center for Career Development. It's you know, a great way for us to engage our monogram winners and former student athletes and letter winners who, who know the process and know what you're going through and you're navigating and they're uh, gracious enough with their time to kind of share some of that advice perspective direction. So um, thanks in advance to, to Joe, uh, but also to, to Elizabeth, to Jim and Carlisle for uh, carving out an hour for us and, and kicking off this lessons learned series. Um, to the student athletes, we're, we're so proud of you guys for everything you navigated these past several months and hopefully you're all home and, and had a chance to relax and catch up. I know it was a taxing semester, no fall break and just kind of grinding every day, but that, that's in your DNA. That's what you do and that's what you know. So, uh, but we're proud of you and, and we look forward to getting you guys back here in, in February for the start of the spring slate. But uh, on behalf of the Monogram Club, um, just appreciate everybody's time tonight and just know that that is the, the, the kind of foundation of the club is to be a resource for you now during your student athlete experience, but even more so after your four or five years in South Bend, whether it's, you know, career related or, or whatever that might be. So, um, so with that, um, Linda, I don't know if you want to kick it to our, uh, our moderator tonight, uh, Elizabeth, but we can kind of dive in. Sounds good. And just a little plug for James Biddick. You all, you know, you, you all know James, but James is amazing. And you'll probably, if you haven't spoken to him already, you'll be getting that outreach from James to get in touch with him to talk about career discernment. And James is an incredible resource. Do you, do you want to say anything, James, or should we just let our panelists go? All right, James is good. So we're, we're, what we decided to do is we really wanted um, to have our Monogram Club members really um, facilitate it and just have this panel discussion. So we've asked Elizabeth Lombard to be our facilitator for tonight. So she's gonna be the moderator of the conversation and has amazing um, background to share with you. So Elizabeth, I'm gonna kick it off to you and then maybe we can have each of our panelists introduce themselves. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Linda. So I'll start. I'm just so grateful for this opportunity to kind of feel connected to campus again. I know, especially during COVID, we're all feeling like a special place in our heart that we miss Notre Dame. So uh, about me, my background, I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago and attended Notre Dame. I double majored in accounting and English and earned my monogram as the personnel manager for the Notre Dame football team. So I was the senior manager there. After I graduated, I became a CPA and worked for Deloitte and Touche in Chicago in their audit practice. Worked there for two years, then decided I really missed Notre Dame and came back to get my JD MBA. Uh, so finished that in three years and just graduated virtually this past May. Took my bar exam, still anxiously awaiting results and am working right now. Just started work in New York City for a law firm uh, Sullivan and Cromwell and working in their corporate practice. Um, so I'm really excited to share 
my lessons and the lessons of the other people on the peer, on the panel with me today. So I'm really excited for that. So maybe I'll kick things off next to Carlisle if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everyone. I'm Carlisle Holiday, uh, class of 04. Um, I grew up in Texas and then um, from there, headed to Notre Dame um, as a part of the football team, uh, was there as the quarterback and, and team captain while I was there. Um, after, you know, finishing up at Notre Dame, I spent a couple of years in the NFL um, for the Cardinals and the, the, the Green Bay Packers. And then from there, I transitioned into the, the real life experiences of working, um, started at a kind of a, a smaller private firm doing some sales and recruiting there in HR. And then over the last kind of Eight, eight or so years, I've been at McKinsey and Company, which is a management consulting firm here, um, leading recruiting in, um, in several areas, as well as some of the people development and HR space here at McKinsey. So excited to chat with you all about that. Um, you know, and, and again, great to see the faces here today on this call. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, next, Jim, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Elizabeth. Um, so I played midfield uh, for the lacrosse team from 2010 to 2015. Um, so I'm five years out now. Uh, during that time, I was a captain twice, an All-American twice, and I made it to three Final Fours. Um, I was a finance major uh, before graduating in 2014 for my uh, summer internship, was considering investment banking or sales and trading, and got a chance to do sales and trading at Bank of America. Um, Came back and I had a redshirt year, so I was able to do a, a one-year MBA program in 2015. And that's when I kind of shifted towards consulting. Um, and then th for my five years since then, I've been with Alvarez and Marcel. So I went through the, the campus recruiting process uh, through their Chicago office and then transferred to New York. So I've been there for, for the past five years. Awesome. So we're both in New York. That's good. Learned something new too. Um, so I think to get things started, we're going to talk a little bit about the impact of COVID-19. So I know all of you have felt this impact really strongly, whether that be in your personal lives, your sports lives, your academic lives, I know you guys could probably talk about this forever, but we wanted to hear just like from the panelists from us three, how it's impacted us professionally and personally, and maybe some of the silver linings that we've found. Um, so Carlisle, do you want to speak to any way that that's impacted you so far? Yeah, I'll start with just the personal side of things. So for me, it's I'm someone who loves to be around people and, and kind of that outgoing and I'm always in the office. And not only that, my fiance, she works at McKinsey with me as well. So um, just the change of all of that, we're on Zoom calls and we're in San Francisco and we're in like this, this you know, OK size apartment. But now we hear hear each other and, you know, I'm hearing her on calls and, you know, like what's going on here. So that kind of dynamic has been a little interesting during this time. Um, we've adjusted, but at the, in the beginning, it was kind of kind of weird and, you know, internet not working, et cetera. Um, so that part, the personal part, there were things that we had to adjust to, which were, um, you know, us as partners had to get used to and, and the changes that had to go on, especially working in the same company. Um, you know, we, we figured out a lot of things. We feel like we still do like each other. That, that's the good stuff. But Overall, was just that adjustment and, and not being in person, which I'm sure you're all going through and having those relationships with other colleagues or other students, not being able to see them in person and having to adjust to going virtual online. Um, those were the biggest adjustments for me personally. Professionally, it was something that um, we had to adjust as a company, um, not only myself, but everyone here at McKinsey, where you know, we're no longer at our clients. How do we do this virtually? Um, you know, how do we, we feel like we're still making that impact? How we do, do we do the core, school, the core skills that we're looking to do and implement to our incoming classes? What the problem solving, the things that we really, um, we really, really value when it comes to, you know, why people come to McKinsey in terms of the training. How do we shift that to the virtual setting? A lot of like what's going on in school right now. Um, so those things that we had to adjust to, but we're doing a really good job of it. A lot of it is because we kind of, we're already doing some of those things that were necessary because we're a global firm and we work with people across the globe, um, teams, et cetera. So I think that's where the biggest impact has been, um, you know, adjusting to the, the kind of virtual nature of everything, not only personally, but professionally. And again, it was, it was something that I, it took a little bit of getting used to in the beginning, but now we're, we're kind of used to it and. Um, now we have kind of this foundation of if we have to continue to doing this model, um, we, we feel like we can be successful in it. So, 
I think that's awesome. And I think you guys as student athletes are professional pivoters. You're really good at, you know, taking things on the fly and making it work. And I'm sure this year has been, you know, especially true in that regard. And so I think that's a great point about adapting. Jim, do you have anything to add about how it's impacted you and your career, your personal life? Yeah, I think I'm going to sound uh, pretty similar to Carlisle here. Um, I'll start personal as well. I think um, I had just moved into a new apartment with my girlfriend, who's also a student athlete from Notre Dame, uh, works for SAP and travels internationally normal, normally. Uh, we both travel a ton and all of a sudden, uh, you know, we're, we're in the same apartment every day, working together, overhearing each other. Uh, luckily, it is a one bedroom, so we have this door that's been saving us. Um, but it's been an adjustment. And, and I think to your point, that's a skill that student athletes have, and it's a skill that's needed in consulting anyway. Um, so being able to adjust and be flexible. Um, we, we did New York as long as we could, and it got a little too scary. So went to uh, the parents' house, and we realized that as hard as it is to work uh, in a tiny apartment, it's probably even harder to work at uh, your parents' house when you're 29 years old. So uh, we're back in New York now and uh, making the most of it. But you know, those kind of pivots and, and making the best of it's important. Um, professionally, I think same thing with Carla, I think, you know, virtual, uh, a lot of that stuff was in place, but we definitely leaned on it more than we had before as, as a company. Um, and I think in general, I think consulting was trending towards a little bit less travel than it was historically. And that just got accelerated with COVID. Um, you know, historically it's the first flight Monday and the last flight, th flight Thursday. Uh, I think you're going to see a trend more of just really defining why do you need to be on site? Make sure it's value add. Um, so that you're there, you know, because it's, it's expensive to, to be sending a, a full team on site. And it's probably the biggest reason for attrition within consulting is the amount of travel. So I think it was a trend that, that got accelerated and um, we'll see what it looks like post COVID. But right now we're, you know, entirely remote. Yeah, I think that's great. Just to add my two cents to it. So obviously graduating in 2020, I had to have a virtual graduation. So that was kind of a bummer of a personal uh, impact, but also fun because my family threw a car parade for me. Like, do you guys remember those at the beginning of quarantine? Um, so that was great. I would say professionally, something that I hope you guys don't have to experience. Um, I obviously had to onboard at a company um, remotely, which is something that might be a real possibility um, for current students. One thing that I was telling Linda before that I've kind of had a way I've had to adapt is I think I have to be a lot more brave um, that I would have had to be in terms of reaching out to people and trying to get work and network. It's really easy when you have like an office mate or you can bump into someone, you know, at the water cooler or getting coffee or at the cafeteria, but it's a little bit harder when you have to like pick up a phone or send a Zoom invite. And so I just encourage you guys, if, if this is how your jobs start, or even with networking remotely before your jobs start, just really recognize people want the contact. So sending that email might seem a little scarier than it is bumping into someone getting some water or coffee, but they want it just as much. And so um, take that chance. Uh, and then also awesome benefit is that you get to wear comfy clothes when you work, which is great and can never be understated. Um, so the next question I think is kind of a little bit <laughs> more specific to Carlisle, but we were looking to kind of talk about what exactly you look for in a job candidate. Uh, how can our student athletes tell their story of resilience and strength? And uh, maybe Jim can even spike to after what, how he told his story. I think that might be helpful. Um, so we'll start with Carlisle. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's unique because I, I've recruited at every level, like graduate students and undergrad and, you know, whether it's an MD or MBA or PhD and then undergrad. So at McKinsey, and, and I'm sure it's the same for other consulting firms, we look for the things we look for whenever you, we, we want to look for you to go to a client and do those kind of things. So it's the, the ability to problem solve and, and think strategically, which when you're a student athlete, that's, you know, what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis as you're, you know, in your athletics and thinking about those things. So it's that, it's the ability to work in teams. Those are kind of two of the three biggest things right there where student athletes already have those ingrained into them, um, which is why we see success when, when student athletes come and interview and in and, and those specific dimensions, uh, we see you know, distinctive spikes everywhere. Um, it's that, it's having an entrepreneurial uh, spirit. It's not necessarily creating your own companies, but having the ability to set goals and achieve those goals. So things you talk about in, in your day-to-day -day activities when it comes to athletics. Um, and then um, I'd say outside of that, just um, the ability to kind of really um, continue to think 
beyond the norm. Um, so at McKinsey, you know, here our goal is not to solve the easy problems, it's to solve those problems that clients can't solve themselves. So continuing to think that way, um, you know, what's next? You come up with an answer, what's next? That's what we look for. But the main things I always say, uh, especially when it comes to undergraduates, um, is, you know, the ability to think strategically, um, you know, the ability to work in teams. Um, and then again, the, the ability to set goals and achieve those goals. So um, it's pretty straightforward. We look for that um, across the board. Of course, there are other little small elements when it comes to, hey, do you have experience, you know, working somewhere for an internship or a specific indus industry, et cetera. But, it, you know, it all boils down to the kind of those core things that we look for in all skills at McKinsey, which is the problem solving, the teamwork, you know, that achieving element. So. That's great. Um, Jim, do you want to talk about your interviewing experiences and maybe like balancing that with student athlete responsibilities? Because I remember that was a struggle, um, just kind of your interviewing experience and what, what you think students should do to stand out. Yeah, I think um, to Carla's point, you know, they're just looking, consulting firms are looking for people that they can put in front of clients as quickly as possible that are going to be able to handle any challenge that comes with them and know when to, when to ask for help. Right. And so coming off as a problem solver, someone that's flexible and someone that can, can handle an executive conversation at a young age. Um, I think the, the interview process kind of showed me that, that that's what was important. You know, my junior year, I think my resume looked a lot like every other basic student athlete where it's, you know, time management and I'm able to be an athlete and a student. Um, but there's a lot more than that. And you really need to kind of sit down and think about what is the past few years being on a team, a competitive team really taught me, um, you know, it's problem solving. You guys do it as a team all, all the time. It's teamwork. You know, when you get to the next level, that's working with your project team as well as with the client uh, and being able to have difficult conversations. Every locker room has difficult conversations. Um, and so I'm sure you guys all have stories you can think about where either you've had to do that or you, you've seen it happen and, and can learn from it. Um, and then that executive presence uh, dealing with coaches, right? I think that's a, a lot of uh, what, what taught me at the next level to to talk to someone that I may be a little bit intimidated about or, or that I know might not give me the, the best answer, um, you know, having the confidence to go uh, kind of express your point of view. So, um, and then the other ones just for consulting, right? The, the willingness to travel, being flexible and adaptable, that's something you've had to do. No one should get into consulting because they love travel, right? But you should gotta be able to handle it. Uh, and I think that's something you guys can all say you've done. And then just to add on what Jim said with the, just the ability to be flexible, I think, again, that's something where athletes are moving on, you know, whether it's a play or, or a match or whatever it may be, the ability to do that when it comes to consulting, because, you know, that's what they're looking for as well. Um, you know, how flexible can you be? Are you team player, et cetera, um, you know, moving on. And then if things change right away, can you adapt to that, which happens on your day-to-day -day life? So um, those are just really, really key elements there that he mentioned. Yeah, I think that's great. And something we talked about a lot in my MBA program was really spending the time to write out your stories. Like Jim said, you guys have so many stories and sometimes life's moving so fast, you probably forget the ones that could be most beneficial to you in a behavioral interview. So maybe I'm promoting James here a little bit too and meeting with him, but just meeting with someone and getting the time to, you know, write out those stories. We call them car stories. I don't know if they still do that. Um, but basically being able to express, get across, tell your story and get the point that you're trying to get across. That's so important because the stories are there. I'm sure of it for all of you. Um, it's just a matter of spending the time to tap into them. Okay, so next we were going to talk about discernment. Um, so how we ended up, where we ended up, did we fall into it? Did we, you know, we know day one at Notre Dame, this is exactly what I wanted to do. Um, and I guess I can go first just to kick it off. Um, so when I came to Notre Dame, uh, I did think I wanted, I thought I wanted to go to law school, but then I got busy with football managing and life came at me fast. And I took accounting with Professor Meyer and I was like, oh, I'm pretty good at this. Uh, I can do this. And so I just kind of decided to fly with it. One thing I liked about it was that there was a very set recruiting path. Um, there's a lot of set options, what you can do as a public accountant people need public accountants. And so I kind of went down that path. But one thing I wanted to share with you guys, because I think it's encouraging to know that your first job probably won't be your forever job. I think sometimes that sounds scary, but it's a good thing because you don't need to know what you want to do um, when you're 22, 23 years old forever. 
And what I did when I knew I kind of wasn't loving public accounting, what I did was I looked around me at what the people I was working with were doing. And I was jealous of the attorneys that I was working with. So I was like, I won't do what they're doing. I get to kind of work with them in like an offshoot, but I want to do that work instead of what I'm doing. And so I encourage that for you guys when you start your first jobs is especially like if you are in consulting, you're going to be working with accountants, you're going to be working with attorneys, you're going to be working with, you know, people uh, in-house at the company. So really keep your eyes peeled at like every element of what's going on around you and you're going to find something that you like. And especially in consulting, sometimes you get to see the insides of industries and businesses and that's where maybe you're going to end up one day. And so I just encourage you guys to keep your eyes and your ears open and you're going to find something hopefully that you fall into that you like. Um, Jim, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, I'll give a little bit of my story on, on how I got to a &M. So um, as I mentioned, my, my junior year, kind of doing the internship uh, process, um, being a lacrosse player and a finance major, I, I felt like there was only two options for me. It was either sales and trading or investment banking. Uh, and that's because both industries have done a great job building the, the Notre Dame network and had a lot of support kind of through the process for both of those. But it did feel that kind of that was it. Um, and so I, I ended up getting the sales and trading internship and at the end of the 10 weeks, uh, and probably a little earlier than that figured out this really is not what I want to do. Um, and that's a great thing to learn. Um, I, I realized that going to the same place and doing the same thing every day was just, it was going to drive me crazy faster than, than I could have anticipated. Um, and this, what really kind of struck me with sales and trading too, was that you're almost competing against the guy next to you rather than working with them. And so I kind of took that step back and realized you know, I love being a student athlete in Notre Dame, love being a, a leader on the lacrosse team. What am I going to miss about that that I want to make sure I continue? And, and it became very clear it was teamwork and problem solving and just kind of an, a new challenge every day. Um, and that's what, what led me to consulting. Um, and so that's where I kind of focused my MBA concentration in the next round of, of recruiting and and. Once I realized that's what's important to me, it was really easy for me to sell my interest in consulting. Again, not because I think I'm going to do it forever, but because it hits those things that I think I'm going to miss about college. Plus, it's a great thing to do when you're not sure what you want to do. You learn about a lot of different companies. Uh, and that's been eye-opening for me is just how different companies can be, how obvious some of their problems can be, frankly, how simple some of the solutions can be. When you're a, a student athlete, you might not realize that the real world is, um, you know, just as messed up as everything else. And, and you just need to come in with some common sense and a, a bias towards action to roll up your sleeves and get stuff done. Um, and that's why I've been able to kind of have some success at a young age as well that I didn't, I thought I would be kind of more climbing a ladder and um, had to get this great expertise when it's really, you know, if you bring the right attitude to a problem, you, you're going to be a value to, to your team. I think that's awesome. And just to echo the point you made about the Notre Dame network, if you're still in the discernment process, uh, it's so helpful to just, you know, cold call, cold email Notre Dame people, especially within the monogram network. And you can simply ask the question, tell me about what you do. Um, people love to talk about themselves. Uh, so exhibit A. Um, so definitely call someone just to hear more about it. Did, did what Jim said like check all the boxes for you and the type of job you want. Um, and then you're going to also be more knowledgeable when you get to the interview phase, because you're going to be able to speak to all of these other people's experiences and how your experiences align with theirs. So I think that that was a great point. Um, Carlisle, do you want to speak to yours? I know yours is a little interesting because you had the sports career, obviously the NFL after. So speaking to maybe how it transitioned out of that as well. Yeah. And quickly on Jim's point with the consulting too, in the beginning, the first couple of years, it is, it is almost like an extension of, of college where you have two more years and you're trying to figure out what to do. And, you know, you're back at it, trying to find a major within an industry that you want to get into or go back to graduate school. So um, that's the approach a lot of people take. Uh, they come to consulting for two or three years, figure it out what they want to specialize in, whether it's going back to school or staying in an industry and then, and then going from there. So um, you know, I, I echo that. Um, but for me, so how I got to where I am, I don't even know how I got to where I, where I am now to tell you the truth. Um, you know, I was someone who, you know, thought I was going to play football forever. And, and, you know, it was kind of up, up and down where, you know, while at Notre Dame, there were some ups and downs. And then, you know, once I left, uh, you know, and went to the NFL, I was like, okay, it's back to the up part of everything. And then an injury 
kind of brought it back down. So um, after I retired at the young age of 28, um, I was actually just took a year off to figure it out um, what I was going to do next. Um, and then I just happened to meet an alum and his brother who had seen me play football and was like, hey, just come and join, you know, this small sales recruiting firm. Um, it was the first person that contacted me and I just said yes, just because I was like, yeah, I need a job. Sure, why not? Um, so did that, didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to do something around people. Um, so uh, started doing that, started doing sales and recruiting and it ended up liking recruiting more just because of the ability to work with people in the people development space. Um, so did that for a year and a half at a small private firm, like I mentioned before. And then I ended up moving up to San Francisco. Uh, and while I was in San Francisco, I said, hey, let's just, you know, see what else is out there. Um, you know, this place called McKinsey, you know, reached out to my recruiter and said, hey, they'd like to talk to you. I, I didn't know what McKinsey was at the time. I didn't pay attention in, in, in college because I was so focused on sports. Um, so I'd say, hey, yeah, why not? I'll just give it a shot. Um, went in there, you know, the next day, met all these amazing people. It was like all of those smart people in college that, you know, you talk to, don't want you to be on a part of their like uh, project teams in college because you're at practice and you show up for like an hour to do the book report, et cetera. Um, so it just happened to be like all of those people in, in you know, at McKinsey, those smart, talented people who are great um, in college. Um, so it said, hey, you know, sign with them in a week. Like, hey, I turned on every other offer. These are the most brilliant people I've ever talked to and ended up joining McKinsey. Um, you know, at that point, again, I didn't know anything about McKinsey, um, didn't know what it was until someone said, Hey, are you nuts? You better join that place, uh, et cetera. Um, and again, I've been here now for over eight years where, um, every year I always, you know, look and see what else is out there. But then every year I come back and say, Hey, you know, there's still a lot to do here. Um, I'm learning every day. Um, the things that I can do every day are still here. As I mentioned, with um, consulting being a place where you can come and figure out what to do, I, I, it's eight years now, and I'm still figuring out fun things to do, um, which has kept me here. So, um, and again, it all you know happened on a whim. I like I said, I thought I was going to be a professional football player forever, um, and you know this. A lot of it had to do with the Notre Dame network, where people were like, "Yeah, you know this, you know the opportunity probably wouldn't happen if I wasn't at Notre Dame." To tell you the truth, but it did because I was there. So. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. I think two important things that I pulled out of that is one, don't put too much weight into a name. Like uh, Carlisle didn't know what Mc that McKinsey was McKinsey. Um, and he, what he was attracted to was the people there and how they were brilliant and hardworking. And I think a lot of times when you meet people at different companies, they're like, oh, I stay here because of the people. And that's true. That's who's going to make you either come to a place or stay at a place or unfortunately leave a place. And so I think that's something that's really important and why I said you have to like be brave and reach, talk to as many people as you can because that's the most important. Those are the people that you're gonna be with all, all day, whether it's virtually or you know in person, hopefully or someday soon. We used to say when we were like interviewing at Deloitte, there was like a, like a 24 hour test or something. And it was like, could you survive working 24 hours next to this person at an audit table? And that's, those are the people that you want to work with, right? And so that's, those are the people that you should, those are the companies you should look to work for when you look around and see those people that you, you think are bringing out the best in you um, and are like-minded. Um, so another question that we have for the three of us is what we wish we would have done differently at Notre Dame or what do you regret not doing with the very limited free time that you had at Notre Dame? Uh, was there any opportunities you missed out on that you think about um, and are, that you regret? And so, um, Carlisle, do you have anything you wanted to just speak to there? Yeah, absolutely. And I tell this to everyone, if there was something I could do differently, and it's hard sometimes for student athletes to do, whether it's, you know, doing a small internship somewhere, um, just to kind of get that feel of like, oh, this is something else that you could think about on top of athletics. Um, it's something that a lot of like, folks who finish up college and go into the NFL, for instance, think of, don't think about well in advance, like, hey, I want to start a company. Um, you see people like alum like Justin Tuck who are doing that now where they're really taking advantage of that, but like really just doing any, any small thing, um, if, whether it's an internship 
externally or at Notre Dame within like a specific office, et cetera, because that really matters. That's just that extra experience outside of your athletics um, that, that kind of comes into play whenever you're starting to think about your career. So if there was anything, it would be that just really start to think about, you know, and it's hard because you're, 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 you're in the thick of things when it comes to athletics and, and your team and training and all of that, that stuff, but really, um, you know, also think about, you know, what can I be doing outside of athletics to help me enhance my brand when it comes to the future? So, you know, I wish I did a little internship there if, if it was possible, but yeah. That's awesome. And maybe everyone on the other on the line will correct me if I'm wrong, but I do think there's more opportunities growing up that are short term for you guys um, that even from 2015 um, weren't there. And so that's like really exciting for you guys and virtual opportunities, which COVID obviously is horrible for so many reasons. But one way that's, you know, helping everyone is that you can do virtual internships, which might not take as much time as having to go travel somewhere to do something. Um, and for student athletes can be a huge benefit. Uh, Elizabeth, Jim, if I, if I yeah. can put a little plug in, I just yeah. put in the chat, um, a winter, the winter session, uh, website for the students. We have a ton of opportunities for you guys, this winter session. If you have any free time, um, we've put a, a lot of winter projects in there. Many of the with them have expired at this point, but there are still like maybe 50 that are still left open awesome. um, for opportunities this winter. But there's also a ton of other incredible things. Like you could do your own like um, a Precipio, I think it is. And Udemy has this like on your own, like do learn anything you want and it's for free. There's a ton of really great oh, resources. Awesome. So I would highly recommend just going into that winter session thing and just kind of looking at what, if, if you have some time during this extended break, just to look at some of the offerings we have. Yeah, I think that's great. And it's funny, some of the things that you don't even think about are what's going to stand out on your resume. Like I was so focused on, you know, Notre Dame football manager being the highlight of my resume, but it was like, I did like a case competition in law school that I loved, but it wasn't, I didn't think that was my highlight. And that was what everyone wanted to talk about when I got to the interview. And so things like that, that you can just add that extra bullet to your resume, which shouldn't be the only reason you do things, but that'll make you stand out. Why not? Especially when they're given to you um, by Notre Dame, which is just an awesome opportunity. Um, Jim, did you have anything to add there? Yeah, I think um, on that topic, yeah, it doesn't have to be the perfect internship, right? That's going to look amazing and get you the, the next job no matter what. It's it's just about getting experience, right? You guys have dedicated a lot of time to sports, and so there, there's not a lot left over. And so you're pro probably playing a little bit of catch up, um, trying to build out that resume and just get those experiences. Um, so it can be anything small. It could also just be networking and having conversations. It doesn't. The person doesn't have to have a job at the other end of the phone um, for it to be worthwhile to just pick their brain on what they do and 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 get some insight. Um, so I think, you know, doing as much as you possibly can and not worrying about if it looks great on paper, just getting those experiences, they'll come with their own stories that you can talk about in, in interviews, um, and then networking as much as you possibly can, right? The Notre Dame network is probably a big reason uh, your parents wanted you to go here in the first place. Um, so, so take advantage of that. Um, it doesn't have to be super formal. Again, it doesn't have to be tied to a job. Just get to know what people do. Just ask them about the challenges that they face. That's an easy question that gets everybody talking. You know, what, could, what keeps you up at night with your work or, or what challenges are you facing? And they'll start talking about that. And you'll see the uh, kind of common threads um, throughout different problems that people are facing. And that's a lot of what consulting is, is, is understanding those problems and how to solve them. Um, the only other aspect I would say about, you know, what did I wish I would have done a little bit more at Notre Dame? I think it was probably push myself out of my comfort zone a little bit. Um, I got pretty comfortable with my 50 teammates and best friends and, and the lifestyle that we had and the schedule that we kept. Um, and so getting to know other student athletes or non-athletes on campus, um, building some more um, strong relationships beyond just, you know, a couple of drinks at CJ's um, because everyone's going to go on to do great things. And I, you know, in five years, I've been blown away with, you know, some of the things my classmates have done and some of the relationships have become so much stronger just by checking in with, with people. Um, so kind of building out my own network while I was there and then maintaining that once you graduate is important. Yeah, I think that's great. The one thing I always say is I wish I took better advantage of all of the speakers that come to campus. For you guys, it's obviously in a different flavor right now. It's virtual, but that probably means you're even getting cooler speakers and people that you know normally wouldn't have the time uh, and they're scheduled to come fly to campus. I know 
I still get some of the law school emails and I'm just like amazed with the people that are coming to talk. Um, I know the law school would welcome you guys to talks. I'm sure the business school would and undergrad, you guys all there. And it's as simple as sometimes you can even block your video and just listen in while you're doing homework just to absorb that information. I think I really missed out on a lot of really cool people that came to campus because I was like, oh, I'm really tired after practice. I, I just want to go get food and, you know, watch o The Office on Netflix. Um, but it would have been a cool opportunity to get to seize those a little more. And then I mentioned my case competition I did in law school. There's a lot of those opportunities um, at Notre Dame to get involved in competitions, especially ones that are sponsored um, by firms that you may want to work for uh, one day. And so I would definitely take advantage of those. You might not win the competition. You might not have all the effort to be, you know, the best one. But if you show up to an interview and say, you know, I'm really interested in your company. I even did this case competition and I learned so much from it. You're, that's an automatic, you know, step up on the rest of the people that are interviewing. So I would definitely look out for those opportunities. Um, yeah, and I think that's it. I will make my plug. You made me think of Jim, like all the awesome Notre Dame connections from networking. Um, I, when I got my most recent job, the very first call I got was from a Notre Dame monogram club winner that wasn't even, I didn't even know was working at this, at my firm and was working in a different small office across the country. And I got like a missed call from them immediately being like, oh, I remember you worked for the football team. I was, we only overlapped by one year. This is so awesome. How can I help you? Here's all the people you need to know. And so any way you can make those connections, people are so excited to talk to you. And so I'm scared a lot of times, but don't be scared. Uh, people want to talk to you. So that's great. Um, we're kind of, those were kind of it for my formal questions, but I don't know if um, Jim or Carlisle, if you guys just have anything else you wanted to share with the group, any advice, tips of, you know, anything like that. Hey, I just want to follow up uh, quickly on, on one thing Carlisle said, um, which, and you as well, Elizabeth, which is it's all about people right um and it's all about the people you're working with whether that's a client or or on your team um but it's really hard to figure that out looking at a list of potential interviews or potential applications right um you know you, you have the the company names that you know and, and the ones that you don't I, I would encourage you guys to kind of put everything on the table um explore as many companies as possible take as many interviews as possible because you can't really figure it out on paper um, and once you get that fit and it feels right, I think, you know, kind of trust your gut a little bit, right? So I work at Alvarez and Marsal. I'm sure almost none of you know what that is. Uh, and I kind of knew that at the time. It was between Alvarez and, and Deloitte. And, and one of my biggest hesitations was, you know, my mom doesn't know what Alvarez and Marsal is. I got five years of uh, Notre Dame uh, education and I'm going to go to some no-name firm. But I trusted the people. I trusted the firm. And it was awesome for me because the smaller size of it, really allowed me to kind of shine early, right? We have small teams and the second I was able to earn a little bit of responsibility, they, they gave me a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more, which I'm not sure I would have been able to get at a, at a larger firm. Um, so, you know, it, it truly is all about people. It's not just something everybody says. And I would encourage you guys to just really explore everything because you can't figure it out on paper. Yeah, I echo that. And honestly, there's so many companies that are amazing right now that people have never heard of anyway, that you, you'll find w where your place is. So um, that's my decision always wherever I go. It's all about the people. Um, if it's money that's concerning, you'll always make money as long as you do a good job, um, et cetera. But really just try to find a place where um, people you love and the work that you want to do is there. And, and I always take that approach. Um, but again, I think the only thing else I'll say is Notre Dame, the network is amazing, um, you know, and it's even more amazing for student athletes because of companies understand what student athletes go through. And it's, you know, it's kind of looked at above work experience um, a lot of times. So, um, you know, there's a lot of resources. And, and again, I, I wouldn't be where I was without the Notre Dame network and random people wherever I go saying, hey, you know, come stay with me when I first left Notre Dame, et cetera even if they didn't know me. Um, so yeah, um, you know, re really, really in great shape being a, a student athlete at Notre Dame. Thank you. And we guys. also wanted to leave this open for questions from, um, from the students as well. So if anybody would like to just go off mute and ask Elizabeth or Carlisle or Jim a question, please feel free to do that. We wanted this to be as interactive as possible too.
I'll just chime, chime in there with a with a quick quick monogram club plug. But what Carlisle said there is, um, and and all of our panelists have talked about the network, right? Um, but even more so for the student athletes, and uh, you know, 8,500 monogram winners worldwide, and. Uh, I'm no salesman, right? Uh, but when we call upon a monogram winner that says, hey, this junior on the men's lacrosse team is interested or sees themselves on a similar career path, would you carve out, you know, a half hour, an hour to, to jump on a call or connect on campus? Guess what? The answer is always yes. And then from every one of those connections, they're going to come up with three or four more. And that's what's so great. What I appreciate about the partnership with, with James and with Linda um, and also to, to engage our, our former student athletes, because that's that's a way, sure, coming back for for weekends and doing the things that are kind of fellowship focused, where they really want to give back and where they really find um, find that value in, in staying connected is helping kind of that that the future generations, because like I said earlier, they they know the struggles, they know the challenges, but um, they've navigated it, right? Jim, Elizabeth, Carlisle have made it and are finding extreme success beyond Notre Dame, and so will you. Um, and then just one piece on the resume, uh, James Biddick is, is the resume guru, but a lot of times um, I work in a sport admin capacity and some of our student athletes will say, gosh, my resume, I just, you know, when I look at my peers, they have three or four internships and you can never downplay what you're doing as a student athlete and, and a, a monogram winner, right? When you talk about teamwork, accountability, leadership, performing under pressure, all of those things. And, you know, James and, and his colleagues at the Center for Career Development can help you kind of tell that story on a piece of paper. But I just say never sell that short. Um, I'm biased, but if I'm if I'm in the hiring manager seat and I see uh, two resumes stacked up against each other, but I see the interpersonal skills of, of this, you know, monogram winner student athlete versus this stack in the resume pile, I think I know which way I'm going to go. Um, and I think a lot of the employers that come to campus and talk to you feel that same way. So um, take advantage of the, the resources and the, the network that's in front of you and always use myself and James and, and the rest of the club to help you along the way. Quick question. You might have touched on this a little bit already, um, but can any or all of you speak a little bit more as to like what would you say is the most fulfilling or your favorite part about your current role? And then also maybe like the most difficult or most challenging thing that you're doing. Sure, I can take that first. Um, I think what's most rewarding for me is just helping people through a difficult challenge, right? Um, so I do a lot of uh, merger and acquisitions um, and, and corporate transformations where the board has decided that two companies are going to merge or that the company needs to change dr dramatically. Um, and they're asking the company, the employees to kind of do things above and beyond their, their day job. Um, and those same employees that are asked to do a little bit more work than normal or also have a bunch of uncertainty around what their role looks like in the future, um, which, which can be a challenge, but I actually enjoy helping them through that process, um, giving them the structure to complete the ask that's above their day job, um, but also making sure we go through the right process and, and put people first as we go through this difficult time um, because change is difficult and that's what consulting is. It's, uh, it's helping them through change. You know, There's a lot of different types of consulting, um, but it, it's all rooted in that and, and helping an organization through change uh, is something that I really enjoy. Um, frankly, my biggest challenge has been uh, work-life balance and just not throwing myself too much at a project. Um, and, and again, I, I've kind of said it before, I've been able, been able to earn more responsibility. Uh, and I've been so focused on that out of school, just, you know, give me more, give me more, um, that you kind of burn out a little bit. And I was becoming kind of the single point of failure for our project, which is never a good thing. Right. Um, and so kind of making sure that, that I I'm balanced in, in kind of work and life so that I'm bringing the most of my client when I'm there. Um, and also making sure that I'm not kind of the single point of failure. I got other teammates to know what's going on and I'm delegating kind of working together. I think that's great. I just started my job a month ago. So I think part of what drew me here and what has been true so far is that no day has been the same. Um, every project's different and there's not always a right answer, which I love because it forces us to be creative um, with the law researching things and even partners being like, that sounds good. That sounds creative. And just being a first year associate and getting to have that impact on, you know, big companies that I never imagined I would ever be dealing with um, is really cool. 
and I'll echo the work-life balance already starting. I'm so excited and I want to do so well and impress people and I'm just throwing myself in, but it's important to draw those boundaries, especially early on, um, because once you go past them, people will be like, oh, she wants to work till, you know, whatever time of night and take advantage of that. And so just uh, respecting your work-life balance, I think is really important. And, and for me, it, a lot of it, I touched on the people side of it, but it is, it is that kind of whole process of helping someone find a job and, you know, the stress, the stress that goes into it, as long with the excitement and having them prepare and then getting that opportunity. It's, it's for me, it's fulfilling just to see them on what they've gone through and accomplished um, to get to where they are. Uh, and at the same time, it's the kind of reverse because, you know, when I'm on the professional development side where I'm staffing them as well. Um, it's having those harder conversations two or three years into it where it may not have been the right opportunity where you have to have that conversation like, hey, let's talk about maybe an exit plan and, and seeing where we can, you know, find something that, you know, fits your skill set. Um, those are may maybe the tougher conversations where, um, you know, you've, you've done this amazing work and then you have to have these conversations down the road, you know, because it may, be, may not be a fit. But um, at the same time, you do know, like, hey, they, they built something and they may move on to find whatever it is that, that's a fit for them. So, um, you know, that's kind of the, the conundrum I'm in um, for the most part. Thank you. Uh, can I ask a question? Okay. Um, so what advice would you give someone starting out their career online um, outside of the soft skills of like being flexible um, and having like high emotional intelligence? I'm looking for more like actual uh, steps outside of soft skills. Yeah, I can kind of speak to this since it just happened. Um, I think one thing that was important to me was setting up a space that becomes my professional space. Like Jim said, I'm living in New York. So my apartment's not in, in like Carlisle too in uh, California. It's not like the most spacious, but setting up that professional space for yourself. So you feel like something's changing, right? Something's changing from day one to day two, where I'm starting this new career. I'm and I actually do dress professionally, at least in my shirt, so that you do feel like, okay, this is, you know, I this is my zone. I'm building my brand. I'm building my career. Um, this is this is how I need to start. Um, I think otherwise, also being, I guess, it's kind of as a soft skill, um, but being comfortable with the fact that you're not going to know a lot of things and being willing to ask questions. Obviously, don't. You have to be a problem solver to some extent, but you need to be willing to raise your hand and say when you don't understand something or when there is a question that needs to be addressed by the team. And so uh, that can be difficult to do and feel awkward when you first start. Um, but I think it's really important, especially in the virtual world, because no one sees your confused face and no one sees the frustration that you're experiencing because you're in the privacy of your own home. And so I think those have been the two biggest hurdles to me, at least starting. Um, and I would say for me, I think, um, you know, networking never, never stops. And that's probably uh, a little scary for some of you that are dragging your feet with it right now. Uh, I know I was at, at your age. Um, to me, it, it felt salesy. It felt, it felt fake. Uh, I felt like I was asking people for things. Um, and I probably built it up to be a little bit more than it really needs to be. Um, and I thought of it as, you know, I just got to get this job and then I'm done. Um, you know, you constantly need to network. You constantly need to get to know people and stay connected with people. Um, so once you, once you line on a job and it's your first day, now you need to internally network and figure out what that plan is. And it's a lot easier, uh, pre COVID or post COVID when you can, you know, go to the office happy hour or for consultants, you know, normally Friday in the office is your chance to really get to know people. Um, so you got to figure that out virtually. Uh, we've had a group of new hires just start. And so really focused on that, that class coming in, they should have a text group, they should have a, you know, Slack or whatever it is. So they're staying connected on a daily basis, right? Then weekly, maybe, you know, all the analysts, you know, so 15 to 20 people have a check in just to learn from each other, right? Then you also want to build a list of the senior folks that you need to get to know, and maybe prioritize them based on, you know, the areas that they're in, or the relationship you may already have from interviewing and getting on their calendar for 15 minutes just to get to know them. You got to really ingrain yourself in the firm 
which is difficult for consultants. Um, you know, that's just a general challenge that we always have that I'm sure Carlisle deals with where you have teams that end up feeling more like part of the client than they feel like they're part of McKinsey uh, just because they're spending so much time there uh, and, and for long periods of time often as well. Um, and so realizing that, you know, no, you, you work for McKinsey, you work for Alvarez and Marcel, you got to build that network and you got to focus on it. Uh, don't put so much pressure on you, yourself that you got to meet the whole firm in a month because you're just going to kind of burn out or uh, figure out what's realistic, set realistic goals, and then hold yourself accountable to that. But uh, I think networking and then I, all the virtual training and stuff like that, the firm will give you those materials um, and you'll have to dedicate some time to it. But the networking is really on you to kind of figure out what works for you. Yeah. And I echo that all the way. And it's the networking and just thinking of, you know, working out techniques that work for you, whether it's like you said, putting some time on calendar for those, you know, and those you don't um, just to, you know, it, it allows you to be more empathetic to situations that are going on with, you know, working virtually and they understand what you're going through as you get started, et cetera. Just those things are key. You're listening to all your colleagues, meeting all these colleagues, um, if, if it is a virtual environment, um, you know, and then the only other thing I'd say is just be open to change because, you know, especially this year, it's taught us a lot where, um, whether it's restructuring organizations or maybe you wanted to work in this specific department, and it's not happening because of some certain reason, um, you know, just be open to dealing with change, which again, student athletes are open to that, um, more than others. So just being open, um, to all that comes your way. Um, I'll say that. Yeah, and Sean, I would just like echo what Elizabeth said in the beginning that like being brave to to reach out and to try to make those connections to to Jim and Carlisle's point about um, connecting with the people on your team and like actually being brave enough to say, hey, do you have 30 minutes that we can get onto a call and you know get a chance to to get to know one another? That's how Matt and I got to know each other because I I was you know new to this position. I'm like, hey, I should I should reach out to Matt. I mean, we didn't know each other at all, but just like taking that. Um, initiative to to set up something and, and get to know some of your colleagues i think it's it's hard to do but i think that's really important especially in the virtual setting and one more on this topic is um you know there's no stupid questions when you first get started right i think think about what freshmen can get away with uh on your teams when senior year if you do some of that stuff you know there's no time for that um so so use that as an opportunity take advantage of that ask as many questions as you can that can be starting a new job at a new company or getting on a new project uh, for a new client. You have that window where you're supposed to be getting up to speed. And if you're sitting in the corner quiet about it for months, uh, and then when you ask the dumb question later, it's not going to have as good of a response as if you were kind of aggressive up front, acknowledging what you don't know and trying to get it learned as, as much as humanly possible, just like you probably were, you know, freshman year when you showed up on campus. And, uh, a senior associate the other day told me she was glad I asked questions because she said when people just nod their head and say yes, that means they probably didn't absorb anything. So people are appreciative when you ask um, smart, you know, questions or questions related to what you just talked about because it means you're digesting the information and no person that's starting day one would be able to, you know, digest everything without some questions. And so I think that speaks to Jim's point. Yeah, and if you, if you do understand it, then repeat it back to them, right? Show them that you get it and show yourself that you get it. And that way they'll, they'll agree or say, oh, no, you know, or, or they'll add to it. Um, but keeping that communication, don't just be a nodding head. It's, it's difficult. Zoom calls, it works. But other than that, you got to gotta be uh, aggressive. And to Jim's point, make sure you take notes. I think like so often you want to pretend like you know it all, but there, the, especially when you're just starting out, take notes and like make sure to like, as Jim said, say back to the person like what you just think that you've you've learned but the note taking i think is crucial because it shows that sense of humility that you don't know it all and that you want to learn from the person that you're talking with hey john i can tell that you're talking but we can't hear you And if, if, you, if you feel free to put it into the chat and we can, um, we can get your question that way. Um, so we'll, we'll take John's question in the chat. And then I think we'll, once we have John's question, we might have time for maybe one more. And then I definitely wanna 
make sure I let the alums go and be respectful of their time. So let's see, um, let's see what John has to share with us. And while, while John's typing that out, I did want to put a little plug in also for the uh, the next two uh, sessions that we're going to have as well. So we're going to take a break for the holidays and let you all just enjoy some um, some time for the holidays. And then on January, Monday, January 18th, we're going to do our, our second session, which is going to be focused on financial services and real estate. And then our third session is going to be on Monday, January 25th, and that's going to be focused on advertising, marketing, sports, and entertainment. But again, um, as we said in the beginning, I think these lessons learned go across industry. So feel free to please just join us with any of that you are able to, to join us for. And Elizabeth, you want to launch John's question from the chat? Of course, if, if I remember to unmute myself. So John asked a question mainly towards Carlisle um, based on a recruiting side question. How have you seen applications change during this COVID summer? How have you seen applicants get creative and best representing their brand after having a very non-traditional summer and year, I guess? Yeah, for, for me, in terms of applications, I we there's I'll say this, there's 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 there hasn't been any decrease in the number of applications we've seen. It's actually been more. Um, and then in terms of um, the changes, I'd say we've seen a lot more shorter internships, virtual, like within applications and on resumes, et cetera. And, and I think, as we mentioned before, it doesn't have to be these no these name brand companies that you're at. It's um, you know joining startups, um, whether it's two or three person startups or twenty or thirty person startup, et cetera, um, for a couple of months just to get experience. You know, there are schools that have time off, um, or or schools that have shifted in terms of their learning and and their their schedules. Where we've seen a lot of those kind of things, but overall, um, you know haven't seen a, a huge shift in the, the type of applications or the number of applications, et cetera. It's actually been more. Um, in terms of like, again, you know, how to make sure that your brand is represented. I always tell people, include whatever you feel is important um, when, it, when looking at applying to a specific company. Um, if you feel like it's important, even if you like, if it's a small thing, put it on there, put, put it on your application, put it on your resume. Um, especially if it's an undergraduate application for MBAs, there's typically more experience, but if it's undergrad, if you're part of a club on school, if you've done a project at, on campus, um, as Elizabeth mentioned, you know, case, case workshops or case competitions, those kind of things, I say, leave nothing off. No one's going to dock you for putting too much on your resume. Um, it, usually it's that one or two things where you're like, oh, I love that small thing on there. That's perfect. Um, so I think that's what I always advise, you know, candidates or students. Like, if you feel like it's important, put it on there. It, it's not going to hurt you. Um, so yeah, um, that that's probably the the best advice I can give when it comes to making sure your brand is represented. Don't if you feel like it's not important, don't take that approach. Put it on there, um, et cetera. Well, I need we... the thumbs up for those hands. <laughs> We have, uh, we've hit our, our mark. And again, I, I always try to just end these on time because I just, I'm so grateful for our alums time and I want to make sure to be respectful of the alums and, and our students, obviously also. So thank you guys so much for joining us tonight and um, just have a wonderful holiday season. Merry Christmas to everybody and happy holidays. And, and hopefully students, you can take a little bit of time just to, to, to be able to take a deep breath and, and rest and, and really get a chance to recharge because it's been a particularly strange and I think stressful semester for everybody. So take advantage of those winter session opportunities, but also give yourself a break and, and take some time to, to really uh, to let yourself recharge as well. Um, yeah. So everybody, thank you. Uh, Carla, you want to say a final no, thing? No, I was just going to say, if anyone has any questions or like, or needs advice on anything when it comes to recruiting, um, even if it's not McKinsey, I'm always there to help, you know, reach out to Matt or James or, or Linda. Um, I think I saw John Maloney on the call as well, who's joining us next year. Um, any of us, so I'm always there to help. Even if it's me sending a name over, even if I get yelled at, I don't care for my company. Um, it happens all the time. I'm just like, whatever. Um, but again, for other companies as well, um, and need an advice on how to prepare, whatever, et cetera. Um, feel free to reach out to your awesome group here. And I'm always happy to be a resource. Yeah, definitely. And I'm on LinkedIn too. I know law is like 
not the exact same thing, but I did do the big four thing as well. So I have various experiences I could speak to and happy to talk to you guys whenever you need. So feel free to reach out. Yeah, guys, and me as well. Happy to be a resource. Appreciate you guys putting this together. Well, thanks everybody. Have a great night and uh, definitely take up our alums on their offer to, to connect with them. I, and I expect each one of you to reach out to each of us on LinkedIn as well. So make sure to, to keep working on that networking piece and, and reach out to each of us. And, and again, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and thanks for your time tonight.